<laughs> Let's start over. Welcome, everybody. This is Yaron Brook. Uh, I'm broadcasting today from the United Kingdom, from London, from my hotel room in London. Uh, a, a little bit of a different setup uh, when I travel and uh, always always seem to be some glitches, but hopefully, hopefully we'll get through it okay. Um, it looks like the sound and video right now are pretty good, so we'll hope that lasts. Uh, I'm here... I'm here in uh, in the UK for a school tour. Uh, I do this once a year. I uh, travel around the United K uh, the United Kingdom and uh, speak at high schools. Uh, it's it's really a lot of fun. It, it's uh, it's a great age. I find that British um, British kids in high schools tend to be I don't know more questioning, more thinking than American kids. Uh, I think it's an educational system. Remember. I'm also doing these talks at the best schools in England, so I wonder if the best high schools in the United States maybe have a similar, uh, a similar stance, a similar position. But it's uh, it's fascinating and a lot of fun uh, to talk to them. Of course, they're in, in, inculcated with a typical leftist agenda that they get from their professors and their teachers, and is just in the culture. And uh, that is that is hard to avoid, but it's it, it it's a lot of fun to engage with young minds, uh, minds that have never heard the ideas before, and uh, or, you know open them to new opportunities and uh, open them to new ideas and to Ayn Rand's thinking. And I think a lot of these kids go on to read Ayn Rand. I've got I've got you know a certain history here now. This is the third year I'm doing this tour. I'll be doing nine talks. Uh, most of them in London, although four of them will be in the Oxford area, uh, but but some of them outside of London, but in the London region, for example. So today I was at Westminster. Westminster is in really the heart of London. It's, um, it, it's probably one of the best, if not the best of the, uh, of the English schools academic wise really, really bright kids, really good kids. We talked about free speech. We talked about the whole trigger warnings, uh, um, you know, the whole idea of placing your emotions above reason. So the whole issue of free speech uh, was discussed. It was really good. We, we, we even talked a little bit about egoism and, uh, you know, the kids seemed really interested. I think next time I'm going to come, I'm going to do a talk straight on egoism at Westminster because they, they really seemed interested in that topic. And I think uh, there's a real opportunity to open up, open up some minds and open up, uh, open up these kids to Ayn Rand's ideas. I, as I said before, I think many of them actually do go on and read Ayn Rand because they are stimulated uh, and they're, uh, you know, they become interested because of the talks that I give. Um, tomorrow, I've got an interesting event. I've got two events tomorrow. One at St. Paul's Girls School which is one of the probably three, four top girls' schools in the UK. It's, uh, it's a day school, not a boarding school, but all girls' school. Uh, I was scheduled to speak at St. Paul's last year, but they got about an inch of snow and uh, they canceled school that day, so they had to cancel my talk. So I'm back there this year, uh, so that, uh, that'll be interesting. And then in the evening, and I'm really looking for this, in the evening I'm doing a debate at Eton with uh, a... a against uh, a speaker who claims that inequality is a real social and economic problem. So we're going to debate inequality at Eton. Now, I don't know how much of you know about Eton, but Eton is like the top boarding school, boys boarding school in the UK. It, oh my God, YouTube looks like it's going to, it's a, it's a disaster. So, um, So I'm just going to, uh, we're just going to, I think Facebook's still functioning. So we're going to keep going this on Facebook and keep uh, keep going at it. Um, so Eton's going to be a lot of fun because uh, these are really smart kids to get into Eton and uh, to stay at Eton. You know, these are really, really smart kids. So I'm looking forward to debates. I'm hoping they videotape it, although I, I have a feeling they won't because uh, these kids are typically not organized around that. And high schools are very sensitive about, you know, videotaping events and around uh, the presence of uh, of cameras in the classroom. But uh, 
you know, so we will see, but, you know, Eaton should be fabulous. The debate should attract a lot of people and uh, that'll be good. Then uh, Wednesday, uh, I'm doing another boys school, I think. And uh, Thursday, uh, I can't remember what school I'm doing Thursday, but uh, all of them, you know, top schools, top schools in the UK. Overall, I'll be doing nine, at least nine is possibility of a 10th school coming together. Actually, um, in addition to the school, the one, oh, I'm doing Sutton Grammar School on, on Thursday, which is another type of British school, I guess, grammar schools, a, a public schools funded by the government, but they're the best public schools. So again, I'll have a great, really, really smart audience. And I'm looking forward to that. In the evening, on, uh, on Thursday, I'm doing a debate at University of Kent, if you're in the UK, you're invited. It's open to the public. It should be a lot of fun uh, against a Marxist. Uh, and we're going to debate capitalism versus socialism. It should be a lot of fun, particularly with Venezuela uh, uh, collapsing. I guess you'll claim Venezuela is actually capitalist, and that's why it's collapsing. And uh, finally, let's see. Finally, we'll be doing, um, I'll be going to St. Petersburg, Russia, both place of Ayn Rand where we will be doing an event to celebrate Ayn Rand. There's a big event. Uh, they're expecting hundreds of people to come. We'll see if, if the, that expectation gets realized. And uh, I'll be talking about individualism and political freedom. Uh, but it's going to be a whole day of programming with lots of Russian speakers I don't know, ta all talking about Ayn Rand. So that should be fascinating to be in St. Petersburg to talk about this. Uh, from there, I go to Stockholm, where I'm doing a Douglas Murray event. I'm hoping that'll be live streamed. Both events, the, uh, the, the, the all three events, actually. The University of Kent debate on socialism versus capitalism, the uh, St. Petersburg event ab about Ayn Rand, and the, uh, the Stockholm event on the death of Western civilization with Douglas Murray. All of those events will be live streamed. And if you go to ARI Europe, I'm sure Ayn Rand, uh, I'm sure Annie will be posting the URLs for all of those, uh, with all of those links for all of those events. Then I come back to UK, I do four schools at Oxford, which I'm really looking forward to. And, uh, and then I, I fly to Prague, where the Ayn Rand Institute is hosting our first European student conference. But it's not just for students. I hope to see many of you adults there as well. We're expecting several hundred people at the uh, Ayn Rand Institute of I It keeps uh, coming in and coming out in terms of the, uh, whoops, now we lost Facebook. All right, no, we're back on Facebook, okay. Uh, <laughs> it keeps going in and out the internet, so I, I, I apologize, but it is what it is. All right, I thought what I'd do today, and you know, the, the bandwidth here is great, so I don't know what it is, maybe, maybe I'm trying to stream Maybe this is trying to stream at too high of a uh, rate. I'm not sure how to change that right now. Let's see if I can go to setting and change that. Audio, video. Um, no, I have no idea how to change that. So we got what we got. Um, let me just... Uh, let, okay, so what I want to talk about today... And I'm going to keep this fairly brief, and uh, because because we've got technical problems, and it's late, and because I'm jet lagged, and uh, I want to. Somebody asked on Facebook if um, somebody asked on Facebook, very tired of the same questions being asked over and over again. I don't really, and I I, I don't I think I don't get a, a, a really tired of the same questions being asked over and over again. It's because it's different people asking the question. The context is always different. And I'm interested in getting to the individual's mind. I'm interested in, in, in impacting the particular individual. So I, I don't think, oh, shit, they've asked this a hundred times because this kid hasn't asked it before. And particularly when I'm speaking in front of what I call virgin audiences, audiences that have never heard this stuff before, then, um, you know, he, they haven't heard this. So it's, it's, it's completely new. And I try to answer the best that I can in the context of the question, in the context of, of the lecture, 
in the context of where I think he's or she is asking the question from. And that keeps it from getting boring because my answers will change in a sense from time to time because they become the answers are always going to be, um, you know, contextual. The answers are always going to be within a particular context. So that's why I don't get bored. All right. I wanted to talk today about the rise of the left of, you know, the, 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 if you will, the leftist view of economics. Uh, it, it, this is spurred by an op-ed that was published by um, Noonan, Peggy Noonan in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend. And, uh, you know, Peggy Noonan's a traditional Republican. Uh, she's a good writer, but very confused philosophically. But she's absolutely right about this. She, she In discussing Howard Schultz, you know, the CEO, former CEO of Starbucks, uh, run for president or what looks like he, he, he might run for president. She says, look, this is a guy who's got a great story, right? He's a kid from New York, real working class family, D you know, wasn't handed anything, didn't get a million bucks from his family. Uh, family went through real hardship, real challenges. And here he is, he builds a company. Uh, the company, his brand is so well known, everybody pretty much in the world knows about it. He's created 238,000 jobs as of 2007. And he's changed the world. I mean, Starbucks has changed the world. It's changed the way we drink coffee. It's changed the way we think about coffee. It's changed. It, it's, it's, it's become, uh, you know, this phenomenon. He's an incredibly successful businessman. And he presents himself as uh, physically conservative, socially liberal. And, and Peggy Noonan says, um, you know, that that's a losing proposition. No, nobody's interested in physically conservative. Take physically conservative as pro-free market and socially liberal. I'll put aside the socially liberal for, for a minute. But let's think about the, the physically conservative. She says, and I'm quoting Peggy Noonan here, America is headed left economically. 2008 changed everything, deeply undermining faith in free market capitalism. One of the great sins of that time and of all the years after was that the capitalists themselves in their vast carelessness couldn't even rouse themselves to defend the reputation of the system that made them rich and their country great. In any case, the most significant sound in 2016 was Trump's audience cheering his vows not to cut entitlements. They would have cheered even louder if he'd promised increases to entitlements. And Peggy Noonan is absolutely right. Trump governs, Trump advocates, Trump is a man from an economic perspective of the left, not a free market capitalism. And entitlements is probably the best example of that. He is not about cutting or reforming or uh, phasing out or privatizing entitlements. He's not for privatizing our healthcare system. He's not for privatizing anything. He's for reducing a little bit of regulation and cutting corporate taxes, which again, nobody really debated the virtue of cutting corporate taxes. But he's not an advocate for the market. He's not an advocate for free market. He's also for, for uh, tariffs. He's also for uh, telling CEOs and telling businessmen what and how to do things. So, you know, and I've talked a lot about Trump. I'm not going to talk about him now. The Republican Party or those who support Donald Trump are not pro-free markets. They have moved dramatically to the left of free markets. Of even the understanding of free market that was, if you will, the Republican Party of 10, 20 years ago. And on the left, what you're seeing is the rise of Elizabeth Warren, the rise of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the rise of Bernie Sanders, the, the rise of even more radical leftists. You're seeing a dramatic shift further out to the left and the middle, the, 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 the Democrats who used to be somewhat physically conservative, somewhat pro, you know, free market, they're a dying breed. They, they don't exist really. And even they have moved to the left because that's where the political party is. And if you're gonna get votes, if you're gonna win elections, that's what you have to play to. So I think it's safe to say, as Peggy Noonan argues, that the country there is, why? You know, why has this happened? Why 
as the country moved so significantly to the left. Now, Noonan states one argument that you hear a lot, and I've made this argument, and that is that we failed significantly in 2008 and afterwards in portraying the crisis as caused by statism, as portraying the crisis as caused by government, and refuting the idea that the crisis was not caused by capitalism, not caused by free markets. Indeed, we should have been arguing the case that there was no capitalism, that the crisis was a crisis of the mixed economy as indeed it was. And she argues that the people who really didn't defend it were the capitalists themselves. And we know this. It was the bankers and the businessmen who refused to defend capitalism. And it was the politicians and it was columnists like her who did not defend capitalism because they don't know what capitalism is. They don't have a clue. And they can't defend capitalism. They don't know what it is. And to the extent that they think they know what it is, they can't defend it. Capitalism at the end of the day is the system of self-interest. Capitalism is the system of the pursuit of happiness, your happiness, the individual's happiness. Capitalism is the pursuit of the individual self-interest, both on the producing side, on the work side, on the productive side, and on the consumption side. The whole economic system is built around the idea of individuals pursuing their own happiness. Ah, this is painful. It's painful that the, the, the video cuts in and out. Um, so it is, it is that self-interest. It is that pursuit of happiness. That is pursuit of individual values. that nobody, including Peggy Noonan, nobody can actually defend, nobody is willing to defend, nobody goes out of his way to defend. Indeed, they're uncomfortable in defending. To, they, at their best, they revert to an Adam Smith-like defense, which says, yeah, everybody pursues their self-interest under capitalism, but we know self-interest is no good. But if you add up all these pursuits of self-interest, it makes society better off because of innovation, because of risk-taking, because of entrepreneurs, because of business, job creation, and all this. So capitalism is good because of that. So it's the Adam Smith argument. If you add up all the vices of all the individuals pursuing their self-interest, you get a better society. And the standard for goodness is a better society. And therefore, capitalism is good. Now, nobody buys that. That is like the weakest, most pathetic defense possible. It's true, as far as it goes, that yes, from a material perspective, capitalism produces the best society, but people are concerned with morality. And what you're telling people morally is that people are committing sins by pursuing their self-interest over and over and over again in everything that they do in life. And that somehow this is washed away by the invisible hand that gives us a richer, more prosperous society. Again, that is not a defense that can work, but that is the defense of Peggy Noonan and everybody else who tries to defend capitalism from the right, everybody else, the, 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 the libertarians and the, and the conservatives try to defend capitalism. At the end of the day, that's a defense. Or a defense from ignorance and depravity. Do you, do you know this defense that they give? People are so irrational. People are so ignorant. People are so depraved that you don't want to give them too much power. And of course, what statism does is gives them. The reason we're opposed to statism is because it's because we don't want to give these depraved, ignorant, irrational human beings too much power. The beauty of the marketplace is that nobody has that amount of power. And again, but this is the argument, as Ayn Rand called it, the argument from depravity. So human beings, irrational. That's why you don't want central planning. No! It's because we're rational you don't want central planning. It's because we as individuals are rational, and we as individuals, therefore, are the only ones who can make value judgments for ourselves. It's not a lack of rationality on the part 
of the central planet. It's not a lack of information on the part of the central planet. It's the fact that he can't be us. It's the fact that every individual is rational. Every individual can make decisions for himself. And the central planet cannot be every individual. And he cannot make choices, cannot make value judgments for individuals. It's the fact that we are competent, the fact that we're capable of virtue, the fact that we can pursue our own lives, our own happiness successfully, that we don't want and central planning cannot work. A supercomputer cannot value for you. A supercomputer doesn't know what your passions are. It doesn't know what your values are. It doesn't know what makes you happy. Only the individual can be inside his own head and know all that. Only the individual has a context in which he can evaluate that. Rationally, of course, objectively, of course. But objectivity, how can an external party be objective for you? How can a third party tell you what your values should be? So it's a um, central planning is not about human depravity. The, the inconsistencies of central planning, the impossibility of central planning. The impossibility of central planning is a consequence of the capacity of every individual to pursue his own self-interest, to be rational, to choose his own values, and that those values cannot be predicted. Why? Why can't they be predicted? Well, because we have free will. Not because the central plan is not smart enough, but because we have free will. And you can't model free will. You can't replicate free will in a computer. You can't do it better. But again, conservatives, libertarians, many, many people out there, you know, they, that's not their defense of capitalism. That's not their approach to capitalism. That's not how they think about capitalism. So the world has moved leftwards. The world has moved leftwards. Not just because we didn't defend capitalism in 2008. We, you know, I did. I, I, every way I could, at every opportunity I could, and every event that I could, on every TV station that would take me, on every radio station that would take me, I tried to defend capitalism as best that I could. But I was a lone voice, voice out there. The, the, the conservatives, the libertarians, and the business community did not defend capitalism. And to a large extent, they did not defend capitalism because they could not. Because they did not have the tools. They do not have the tools. They do not believe in capitalism. They do not believe in self-interest. They do not believe in egoism. They do not have the moral basis on which, or the epistemological basis, the philosophical basis on which to defend capitalism. And that's why we've moved to the left. We moved to the left because, yes, all the problems are being blamed on capitalism. 2008 was blamed on capitalism, and there was no defense. But I would say there was no defense after the Great Depression, other than Ayn Rand, maybe Milton Friedman or von Mises, but basically Ayn Rand. After the Great Society, after the inflation of the 70s, how many people stood up and said, no, 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 the Reagan Revolution is not capitalism. It's just a refinement of the, of the mixed economy. And then by the financial crisis, yeah, Alan Greenspan said, this is a failure of capitalism, this is a failure of markets. George Bush said, we have to abandon capitalism in order to save it, and it's over. It's over. And what we're seeing today is, a, is a, I think, a lunge of the American public to the left. I, I really don't see how we get out of that. It's on the right. It's on the left. It's depressing. Um, you know, and, and, and one, of the, one of the 
you know, signs of that is the now resurgence of Marxism. Marxism is now, you know, back. It's sexy. Socialism is back. It's sexy. As Venezuela is occurring right before our eyes, as another socialist state implodes, Marxists are coming out of the woodwork. Marxists are everywhere. Socialists are everywhere to make the case for socialist Marxist agenda. Uh, I, I, I was reading this article in Vox. Um, why are millennials why are millennials burned out? Question mark. The answer is capitalism. Turns out there's a new book by a guy named um, Malcolm Harris called Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials, where he argues that the millennials are bearing the brunt of the economic damage wrought by late 20th century capitalism, not late 20th century mixed economy, late 20th century capitalism. We haven't differentiated ourselves from, from the mixed economy. We haven't said no. The late 20th century was not characterized by capitalism, it was characterized by the mixed economy. And, and it's the socialism within that mixture that's created the problems. He says all these insecurities and the material conditions that produce them have thrown millennials into a state of perpetual panic. It's generations, quote, generations are characterized by crisis. Then ours is the crisis of extreme capitalism. Extreme, the problem today is extreme capitalism. I mean, what a joke if you understand anything about what capitalism is. Now, this Malcolm Harris, it turns out, is a Marxist. He, he, in an interview here, he writes, well, I take, uh, I take a very Marxist perspective on the world. And later he, he says, I think it's crucial, this, you know, the problems of capitalism, as, um, as the problem of, uh, whoops, I've lost him. Where did he say this? Here it is. Marxists would refer to this as an increase in the rate of exploitation, meaning workers are working longer, harder, and more efficiently but are receiving less and less in return, right? I reference Marxism here because conventional American economics don't really have the term for this. It's not something they like to talk about because they don't recognize that capitalism is built on exploitation. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, this is really bringing Marxism back. You know, uh, uh, um, Marxism was deemed unsexy but now it's back it's popular it's sexy it's cool this book is going to be a bestseller always a bestseller so there's the supposed gap between productivity and hourly compensation and supposedly workers are not being paid for their productivity which when analyzed property is complete bollocks, complete nonsense. Because if you have a level of productivity, then all you have to do is leave your job and, and go find a different job. Somebody's going to pay you more. That's how markets work. There's competition for labor. But, you know, these people don't understand markets. They don't understand what's going on. They distort the data. They, you know, make it up if they have to. Uh, as, as Thomas Piketty uh, did quite a bit. And they tell us the story about how awful the world is, how the middle class is being left behind, how life sucks for the middle class. And by the way, all of this is not the result of the mixed economy, maybe the lack of capital investment because that capital is being taxed away from the producers. It's not because of the redistribution of wealth and the disincentive of people to work. It's not all the licensing laws that reduce the number of entrepreneurs in the economy and therefore reduce the number of productive jobs. No, it's none of those things. It's extreme capitalism that we have today, which is a problem. So, you know, the, I, I'm not going to give the full argument around about this. I'm going to, although I'm going to probably do it tomorrow night because I'm sure this issue is going to come up in... Um, in my debate about inequality at Eton. But what I want to point out is, is the left today is happy to dredge out Marx 
is happy to self-identify itself as socialist? When is the right going to be willing, or the free marketeers, put aside right, left, when are those who promote free markets going to be willing, willing to cite and quote and advocate for the greatest defender of capitalism in human history? When are they going to bring out Ayn Rand, the only consistent defender of capitalism in human history? When are they going to bring out Ayn Rand, the one moral defense of capitalism that exists? When are they going to figure out their attempt to use Christianity, their attempt to use altruism, their attempt to use collectivism, their attempt to use conventionality to defend capitalism has failed? When are they going to have their balls, their guts, to actually revert to the thinker who can actually defend capitalism? The left jumps on the opportunity to quote Marx jumps on identifying itself as socialist. And they know what socialism is. Octavia Cortez knows what socialism is. She intends to implement it on a grand scale. You know, it might be closer to fascism, but at the end of the day, it's going to be statism, government intervention in the economy, redistribution of wealth. She knows exactly what she's doing. Elizabeth Warren knows exactly what she's doing. When, when are those defenders of the free market going to embrace capitalism? Not the mixed economy, but capitalism, real capitalism, real free market, free of government intervention, free of government regulation, free of government controls. When are they going to embrace that and embrace the thinker who most represents laissez-faire capitalism, who most defended laissez-faire capitalism, who most inspired people to think about laissez-faire capitalism? And that's Ayn Rand. Peggy Noonan's no fan of Ayn Rand. Donald Trump certainly isn't. Stand up for a real self-interest-based defense of capitalism. And until we're willing to do that, until there are enough of us, until businessmen who are still respected in this country are willing to stand up and not be mealy-mouthed about their wealth and not be mealy-mouthed about the system that allowed them to create that wealth. But businessmen standing up proudly and declaring that they built it, that it's theirs, that they don't owe anybody anything that is unchosen, that they do not have moral duties, that they, they stand by the system of laissez-faire capitalism consistently and they stand by the ethics of self-interest consistently and that they admire Ayn Rand. If you had a hundred or a thousand John Allison's, John Allison, the former BB, uh, CEO of bb and then yeah, then, it, then the battle would be over. Then the left would be crushed. We need those businessmen. But to have those businessmen, we need the intellectuals. And if we have the intellectuals and we have the businessmen, then we'll get the politicians. So it doesn't surprise me that politicians are not advocating for this, cannot stand up to the socialists. We get the politicians we deserve. All right, we are having lots of, uh, of streaming problems here. So I'm going to call it a night. Uh, I apologize. I will try this again um, in uh, maybe tomorrow night. Probably not tomorrow night. Tomorrow night I have a late night at Eton, but maybe the night after that. We'll see. I will try this again. Uh, try to get the uh, try to figure out why we're getting so much streaming errors. I look uh, I look more carefully at what we're doing. Maybe we're trying to stream at a too high of a bandwidth. Uh, but let me check into that, and I will let you know. In the meantime, I've noticed a lot of you are dropping Patreon, and good, drop Patreon. But not all the people who are dropping Patreon are going and subscribing on subscribe subscribestar.com. So please, if you're going to drop your support of the Iran Bookshaw on Patreon. Please add your support on subscribestar.com. Otherwise, right now, losing many more dollars on Patreon than I'm gaining on Subscribestar. So thank you for everybody who supports the show. Thank you for everybody who intends to support the show. Uh, but I encourage all of you, uh, those who are interested in seeing the show continue and thrive and grow, uh, to uh, support the show, subscribestar.com. Uh, and uh, soon also, hopefully within a couple of days, 
on the iranbookshow.com uh, website. I will let you know as soon as that live. We're waiting for the final SSL certificate, security stuff, whatever. So that, that should go through soon. So uh, thank you uh, for listening tonight. Again, sorry for all the technical problems. And I'll be back on this tour broadcasting, hopefully with better technology in the next couple of days, in the next few days. Talk to you soon. Have a good night. From London, this is Yaron Brook. Bye, everybody.